Hi, I'm DM Galabond. In Last Week at the Table, we look at what happened in the three actual play games I run on my Twitch channel, which you can find at http twitch.tv slash galabond. Now let's get on with the show. On Thursday night, we are playing the Essentials game at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The party finished up their dealings with the gnomes at Gnomengard. Finn, Dorzafir, and Abinadam received four magic items. A hat of wizardry, which gives a chance to cast a cantrip you don't know once per day. A pole of collapsing, which is a 10-foot pole that can collapse down to a 1-foot long uh, rod and then expand again on command. A clockwork amulet, that gives you a free 10 on a d20 on an attack roll once per day. And a wand of pyrotechnics. That makes a distracting flashbang up to 60 feet away. Now, Abinadam asked the uh, gnomes about those water-walking inflatable shoes that they had seen before. And the gnomes let him try a pair out, but they failed when he tried to use them. Apparently, he was too heavy, and they had not created them in the correct size for anyone other than gnomes. So the party returned to Phandalin and was met with another round of drinks and celebrations when they showed off the trophies that they had taken from the Mimic, which were some teeth and the tongue of the creature. They also met a cleric named Haiza, who is played by newcomer Ivy, and a fighter named El, who is played by our other newcomer named Chris. So when the veteran adventurers went to collect their fees, they did a little shopping, and they learned about two other jobs. Over at Barthen's, Barthen's Provisions, Barthen wants them to take supplies to loggers in Neverwinter Woods. He has a cart and the supplies. A customer in Barthen's store also said there are rumors of a dragon sighting on the Tribor Trail. And at this point in time, we took our mid-session break. And then after the mid-session break, uh, we took some time to go around the virtual table for some in-depth introductions uh, between the players. And then uh, we continued the adventure. The whole party went over to the Miners Exchange, where they met Halia and were going to be settling up with her for going to see about the dwarves. So Halia told them there's a new foreman for the Mountain's Tow Gold Mine who has arrived in Phandalin and needs to be escorted to the mine. While they were talking to Halia, a town master burst into the shop and told them that a former sheriff has been attacked on his ranch, which is the Butter Skull Ranch. Now, orcs are blamed for this attack. Harbin Wester, uh, the town master, made an urgent request for the Adventurers Guild to go to the ranch and lend aid to uh, Big Al, as the former sheriff is known. Help the sheriff and bring him back to Phandalin alive for a reward. If he's dead, deal with the orcs and bring back the sheriff's remains. And in that case, Harbin Wester will still give the adventurers a reward. So there was a lot of discussion about the logistics of the order in which to do these three missions, and that kind of ran out the clock on the session. Uh, eventually, the party decided to get horses that were offered by Halia and the innkeeper to ride swiftly to Butterskull Ranch. So we'll start with that adventure next week. And you can join us on Thursday nights on Twitch to catch all of the action. Now on Saturdays at noon... It's the history of D&D. &D. The session got off to a very slow start this week as some of our players had technical issues getting connected. Eventually, LC playing Siren and Mark playing Trophim and Wesley playing Sylvia were joined by a new player, Rox, who is playing Rox. Uh, Rox chose to play a cleric since that is a natural void in the party at the moment. We, went, we spent some time at the beginning of the session reviewing the original D&D character sheet in Roll20 and the rules that are different, such as AC and skill checks. 
the party dealt with capturing the black clad cult or the party dealt with questioning the black clad cultists who had tried to break Larif and the kobold out of prison last week. Uh, the group used a combination of persuasion and intimidation to find one of the cultists who would talk. Once they found a helpful, helpful captive by the name of Raymond, they separated him from the others to get some information out of him. Now, Raymond told them about yet another lair that Bargle has. So they took down notes and directions and the helpful cultist was taken to a separate holding area overnight from the rest of the cultists. In the morning, the anticipated attachment of soldiers arrived from the capital. Their captain, Boris, debriefed both the adventurers and the village council about what had transpired there in Dedale. Now, after further questioning the prisoners, he called for the eight uncooperative cultists, uh, everyone except for Lareth and Raymond, that is, to be summarily executed for their crimes. Now, Lareth and Raymond were put into a wagon that is fitted with a uh, large cage bolted to the bed of the wagon, and they are to be hauled back to the capital and submitted to further questioning by the Queen's royal guards. Uh, now, after the executions, uh, the they were going to bury the cultists, but a couple of members of the party suggested that since this dark lady that these cultists serve seems to attract necromancers to her, it might be a good idea for them to burn the corpses down to ashes and then bury the ashes. And so that's what they wound up doing. They had a big bonfire and burned uh, the corpses of the uh, cultists that were executed. So uh, with two lairs to investigate, Captain Boris and the village council called a meeting to discuss next steps. The captain is leaving 12 guards in Dedale to assist the, um, to assist the, village, uh, the village watch. So Zert uh, offered to take a few of the best trackers among the, uh, among the uh, royal guards to scout the location of the newly revealed lair and bring back intelligence to the town. And meanwhile, the party decided to take some men-at-arms and return to the kobold lair that they had found before. So the next morning, everyone set out. Uh, the party accompanied the soldiers heading back to the capital as far as their turnoff uh, to go to the keep. And they carried uh, with them, the party carried Aethert, Gowis, and three of the royal guards. So when they reached the uh, keep once again, they found the kobold corpses uh, largely as they left them, only slightly disturbed, disturbed by uh, scavengers and wild animals, and just a little bit more rotted, uh, and of course with swarms of flies around them. So they approached the doors of the uh, facility, or the doors of the structure there, and they entered. Going inside, they found an empty foyer and signs of decay. Turning right from the main foyer, they entered a large, empty sitting room. Now, Rox was curious and examined a, uh, an empty fireplace uh, that was in that room. And as he did, debris tumbled down onto him, dealing some damage to him. But behind a loose brick that came dislodged was a fancy silver dagger. So in the next room, the party found zombies, and they had a fight. Now, Rox tried, but he was unsuccessful in turning the zombies, so they had to fight and kill all five monsters. So as the fight was wrapping up, we were running out of time for the session, and we will resume the exploration, exploration of this ground floor of the structure uh, next week. So tune in Saturday to find out what happens. Now, on Sundays at 2.30 p.m., we play The Walker of Waterdeep. This is a 5e game where we cross the streams of lore between D&D &D 5e and Magic the Gathering. 
This week was session 37, and the party finally was able to leave the plain of Toro. But everything did not go exactly as planned, of course. So we started a session by wrapping up the ordination ceremony for Zandri at the Temple of Sune. Then everyone went out for drinks to celebrate uh, at the Yawning Portal, their favorite place. Now, Durnan poured special drinks for everyone in the party, giving them all something that was unique to them. Uh, Oyahusa got an elven wine aged to perfection by an order of reclusive monks. Galabar got a whiskey that's brewed far to the north beyond Icewind Dale, distilled from the fruit of the snow blossom shrub. Or so Durnan claims. Adamant received a tankard of lubricant that the Temple of God had sent over to the dwarven to the yawning portal some time ago. And Thardrum received a special dwarven dark lager. He was suspicious and he sipped it, but Oyahusa and Zandri each chugged a glass of it. Now it had a rather humorous side effect of giving everyone who drank it raven feathers briefly, and both Oyahusa and um uh, Zandri got a case of the belches uh, where they were belching with the sounds of ravens cawing for um, a full minute. So after drinks, Sokala took Zandri back to the temple and the boys went shopping. Later, Galabar used his sending stones to contact his sponsor, uh, or his mother, as he learned last week, and discovered that his Zentarum contacts have been good to their word and she's already on a boat and just a day away from making port at Baldur's Gate. So after their various montages, the party met up with the, at the appointed time with Lady Silverhand, Barnabas Blastwind, the Black Staff, and their other allies from Waterdeep at Castle Waterdeep. The delegation from Ravnica had already teleported in, and they quickly got to business. The senator asked one of her law mages to present a magical map of Ravnica, which uh, hovered over the large table that they all sat around, and she pointed out what she considered to be the most important areas of District 10 of Ravnica. Now, District 10 is where New Prav, which is the seat of the government, is located, and in the minds of the Azorius Senate, that means District 10 is the only district of Ravnica that you need to worry about. And furthermore, District 10 is broken up into six precincts, and there's only about three of those precincts that um, the Azorius Senate seems to take much interest in. Uh, the ones that are uh, basically the domains of the working class or the uh, poor, they, they say that those aren't even worthwhile uh, dealing with and they kind of dismissed them. So the party had a few questions about other parts of the city and about items that the senator glossed over, and the visitors answered them with assurances that uh, they would have guides assigned once they reached their quarters in the diplomatic wing uh, at New Prav, and those guides could take them anywhere they wanted to visit in the city. So once the questions were all answered, the law mages formed up with their charges as the senator had assigned them. They began casting teleport spells, and as the last syllables were pronounced, Oyahusa and Adamant both noticed that their law mage uttered a slightly different syllable than the others did. So the teleportation effect kicked in, and when the opaque dome of teleportation evaporated, the party found themselves in a dark, stinky, fetid underground location, looking at a bunch of bug people. The law mage panicked a bit, and for good reason. The leader of the bug people pointed her at her with a staff and said something about danger in a strange dialect of common that seemed to be part vocalization, part clicks, and part hisses. At that, two monstrous lizard-like creatures with eight legs each bolted from the shadows and gazed at the mage, who screamed and held her hands up, but she withered and seemed to rot before the eyes of the party, falling to the ground dead before the lizard, lizard creatures ran up to take large bites from her flesh. 
The leader of the insect people announced that her name was Caker Lake and called off her pets, telling the party that they were safe. In addition to some warrior guards of her own race, this Caker Lake was accompanied by the two lizard creatures, she later named those Necrolisks, and by a swarm of rot grubs the size of a small pony. And this swarm alternately stood next to Caker Lake and then oozed and swarmed its way across her body between her legs um, and around her uh, feet. And she said that the omens had foretold the party's coming, that they would be the ones who could deal with the stranger and the artifact that has been causing her people problems, and that the visitors would be in the company of a wizard who meant them harm. And indeed, when they looked back at the corpse of the fallen law mage, uh, they realized it had changed form. So she no longer looked like one of the blue-skinned Videlkins that Chindler had mentioned. Instead, the creature was gray, naked, and seemingly completely blank, with no distinguishing features on its gray skin. So Caker Lake said that her people are called the Crawl, and she speculated that the disguised law mage might have been an agent of House Demir, which is a tenth guild that the Ravnikans like to pretend doesn't exist. And perhaps Caker Lake speculated that um, House Demir is so well hidden that it has little hope of taking any power on its own, but it could possibly sway the winds of influence to favor whichever guild gained its backing. Caker Lake said that her people are part of the Golgari Swarm, and they live here in the undercity of Ravnica, where all the death from above falls to them, and they break down the remains in order to nourish new life and restart the cycle all over again. Caker Lake assured the party that they are in no danger from her, and asked that they help them with an issue regarding a stranger and an artifact that seems to be causing them trouble. If they help, Caker Lake will see that her people help the party return to the surface of Ravnica safely, and that they are escorted to New Prav, which is where they are, in, which is where they were intended to be teleported. Now, if the party refuses aid, uh, the crawl will not harm them. Caker Lake says, but the Golgari will not aid the party either, and will just simply leave them to fend. Uh, for themselves until their friends from the Boros Legion and the Azorius Senate can contact them and send help. So without feeling like they had a whole lot of choice, the party decided to see what they could do to help the crawl. They were led to the home of someone called Perrin, and at this home they found two crawl warriors standing guard. Inside the home was a monster that used to be a man, they said, and that had been affected by some kind of artifact. Adamant was given a key, and he opened the door. He found not one, but four creatures inside. The main creature was the size of a giant, and may have once been a man, but was corpulent and covered in boils and lesions, some of which had tentacles writhing out from them, and others which oozed a vile pus. The other three creatures were man-sized and looked like twisted versions of the crawl warriors, each with grotesque mismatched wings. Those three clung to the corners of the ceiling high above, and all four monsters attacked when the party entered the room. Now immediately they learned that the flying creatures had a scream that causes fear, as the fear effect caught Galabar, Zandri, and Oyahusa all in its grip. The giant creature attacked with bites and tentacles, but it could not get purchase on adamant. Now, we didn't get far into the fight when time for our session ran out. We left it at the top of the third round of combat, and we will resume there next Sunday. How will the fight turn out, and what will happen to our heroes? Tune in next Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern to find out. And that's last week at the table for February 18th. Tune in on Twitch on Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays to see what happens in the live games, or keep posted here to find out what happened last week at our table. And remember to always try to make your games memorable so that you can have tales from your own table to share with your friends. 
Good night, everyone.